with a bit of a conversation amongst the panelists, and then we will open up for your comments and questions. Uh, let me introduce the panelists today. We have their extended bios somewhere there, so I'm not going to speak too long about their bios. But we have Antonella Perini, the director of the Political Innovation Academy of Asuntos del Sur, a nonprofit organization based in Argentina that seeks to generate ideas and actions to promote more inclusive and participatory democracies in Latin America. We have Valeria Scorza here, who's the director for the Political Innovation Program at Fundación Avina, a Latin American foundation created in 1994 and focused on producing large-scale um, changes necessary for sustainable development. And on the other end, we have Pablo Collada, who's the executive director of Fundación Ciudadano Inteligente, based in Chile, a nonprofit organization that promotes democracy strengthening in Latin America. So please, everybody, silence your phones if you haven't done so. And for those interested in participating um, via Twitter, the net handle is at NetDemocracy, or check in with our hashtag, uh, hashtag NetEvents. Um, and I'd like to start off by mentioning some of the findings of the most recent region-wide survey of Latino Barometro. <coughs> I'm sure you're all familiar with the, with the survey, but this, the 2017 report was just released maybe a few days ago. Um, and they're important because the findings are not very good news. Latin Americans are increasingly dissatisfied with the health of their democracies. And what's worse, less and less people believe that democracy is the best form of government in Latin America. In 18 countries, support for democracy has fallen on average from 54% in 2016 to 53% in 2017. But what's important is that this is the fifth consecutive decrease since 2010, when support for democracy actually reached a peak of 61%. The percentage of people that are actually indifferent to democracy as a regime has increased from 23 to 25%. Marta Lagos, the head of Latino Barometro, has called this decline the democratic diabetes, a condition that's invisible that does not seem to alarm because the deterioration is low, but that can ultimately damage irreversibly the system if it goes untreated. Uh, these figures show clear signs of deterioration, of democratic deconsolidation. The democratic disconnect between institutions and citizens that Yasha Monk depicted in a Journal of Democracy article published in the summer of 2016 is certainly evident. In Latin America, like in the more consolidated democracies, we seem to be moving from government dissatisfaction and lack of legitimacy to a challenge of the legitimacy of the more democratic regime itself. So the, the setup is, is a rather challenging and complex one. And with this picture in mind, I'll, I'd like to start off and get some reactions from, from you guys. What do you think about these figures? Is this the context that you're encountering in the region when you're working with activists? Valeria? So in one hand, yes. In one f hand, we are looking at, in Latin America, there is a dissatisfaction with institutions. There's uh, low ratings for presidential acceptance. We see that young people and citizens are less inclined to go into the polls, that uh, political parties from left and right, responses to address that dissatisfaction has been limited. But on the other hand, we've been seeing an emergence and new actors coming into the, into the political space and to the public space and creating political innovations. And let me s first say what we refer to political innovations. And when we think about political innovation initiatives is that these initiatives are proposing shifts in political practices that are based in transparency, horizontally, and the co-creation of political agendas between civil society and governments. They are propelling more direct deliberative process in the construction of policy and politics, and they're using uh, technological tools to shorten that gaps between public servants and citizens. So we are seeing that there is an emerging actors arising and really challenging what pol the, that public sphere is. So uh, maybe they're not using the traditional institutional channels that we think 
that to measure that political participation, but we are seeing uh, a great amount of, of young activists taking the streets, taking the media, using hash activism in order to really voice out their, their uh, needs and their agendas. Okay. How about you guys? What's your experience with this? Okay, so um, we have done a research uh, last year uh, precisely with activists we were working with uh, along these this years of work at Asuntos del Sur. Uh, activists like young people who were politically active. Uh, so we did service, we, we done, we, we've done uh, focus groups, and precisely what we found was that uh, although these young people say that uh, political parties and public institutions lack social legitimacy, uh, they also have stated that some progress has been made, uh, but they feel that their uh, promises have been unfulfilled. Uh, so what we found is that they are not having like a reaction. Uh, it, it is not about uh, a reaction against uh, the system, but uh, they want. Um, they are looking for new logics of participation. Uh, which are more collaborative, uh, participatory, uh, direct, deliberative. Uh, that's what we found. Uh, so the thing is precisely they, they want uh, something new, something different, something with these logics of participation. And regarding the, the, um, the concept of political innovation, um, we, we have uh, also this issue because we are talking about political innovation, we are all members of the network of political innovation, and usually uh, this concept uh, pops up in, in many, uh, many events and many uh, panels we, we have, uh, meaning like, you know, we're talking about political innovation, well, but what's innovative about that? <laughs> uh, and it's some, uh, some of our need to, you know, say I it's okay, the, the concept ha has been used and abused, uh, and we need to take back its meaning to re-energize re the concept. Um, actually, we've been um, working on, on a definition about what is political innovation for us. Uh, aligned to what Vale said, uh, we, we think that political innovation is the development of, of practices, of interventions that seek to address, to solve uh, public problems. Uh, always in the way that changes and that has an impact on social ordering. Uh, and in that way, uh, it is always constructive, it has a purpose which is to broaden uh, people's rights and uh, to have a progress on their quality of lives. Okay. Pablo. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> first of all, th thank you very much for this this uh, space, the invitation. and. And I wanted to say that, well, there are so many things happening in, in Latin America and, I, I mean, everywhere, I guess, that most probably we won't have a lot of answers for things, but only we will try to just depict a few uh, other questions. No? For me, in particular, it, it has been very interesting, uh, and I, I always think that we're living the teenage <laughs> years of democracy in Latin America. No? After the the... Uh, dictatorships, the, the long period of dictatorships in Latin America, well, democracy arrived and we were so happy and we were so excited with this new baby that seemed <laughs> flawless, right? And it was really gorgeous and fluffy and, <laughs> and I mean, it was full of, of uh, an amazing future, right? And, and we were so s full of hope and, 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 and so, so much. And then right now we're coming into these teenage days where our uh, uh, legs are long, our nose is bigger than our eyes, and we find that it's not as gorgeous as <laughs> we wanted it to be, and it's turning out to be full of, or at least with certain flaws. No? And it's something that, that is, has been uh, uh, just spurring out in very different and diverse ways. And now we find all the institutional flaws of our democratic uh, structures, the structures that we built and we were full, full of hope, and that the political parties, which after the dictatorships were like, okay, amazing that we have these political parties and the, the, all the interactions that we will see happening and the flow 
of ideas, and now we find that it's it's gotten to be a very restricted institution in terms of the flow of power no? and the interaction and the spaces of participation. And that's specifically where, where we try to work. No? And I think that we may be able to, to, to talk a, a little bit more of these practices, of these examples of how to deal with these teenage uh, democracies, teenager democracies that are uh, trying to find their own institutional strengths, but also practices that will definitely find uh, a better future in terms of governance, of democratic governance, of spaces for participation, and if and and in in really understanding that it's something that, whereas democracies are never uh, static, no, they're continuously. Uh, are, are moving around, but that we may understand that we have a, a base strong enough to build upon that. No? So, so I wanted to, to just uh, inter uh, react that, that way. I like that idea of the, of the democracy being sort of adolescent. Mm -hmm. uh, and this reminds me a little bit of this um, book that Asuntos de Sur published recently. It's called uh, Recuperar la Política, Recovering, Recover Politics. Um, would you start by the premise that, that democracy or democratic institutions in Latin America are certainly losing social legitimacy, and you point to the youth sector as the one with the greatest dissatisfaction. Uh, and then you go on and ask, you know, what, what do we do with this? Uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit how you guys are thinking about confronting this challenge, this adolescent democracy that, that Pablo is talking about? Yes, uh, actually, uh, it's quite interesting uh, when we talk about the young generation, uh, because at least in Latin America, it's a generation that has been uh, born and raised with democracy. So they are used to uh, democratic uh, participation uh, and institutions, but uh, they are also defying the status quo. They are defying uh, these institutions, uh, and they I can't say that everyone, uh, because of digital divides, but uh, many young people are high users of digital technologies, so uh, this combination is a breeding ground for uh, precisely uh, asking for new ways of political uh, participation and new logics of participation. Um, that's why we have been um, also studying and uh, analyzing the different uh, social movements that have been uh, emerging through this discontent and who has uh, have also been um, you know many organize many of them organized by uh, social media or instant messaging uh, such as okay we, we've seen the cases of uh, different political uh, social social movements such as just uh, unidos yo soy 132, uh, and ni una menos and, and so on um we uh, we have been studying these social movements um we we have been studying also different practices that are emerging in what we call the margins of uh, traditional institutions uh we think that regarding the margins of traditional institutions it's important and it's key for understanding how we can solve historical problems uh because it's precisely this population uh, the ones who are defining these uh, topics, uh, situations such as exclusion. Uh, what do you mean by the populations at the margins of the institutions? Okay, so we have seen that uh, our democracies, in order to have uh, a strong democracy, we need pluralization, right? Uh, we have been witnessing that there are mainly elites who are leading uh, politics and political institutions. Uh, there are communities or part of the population who ha are not part of decision-making processes. Uh, so that's why I mean by uh, those, those population, that population who is uh, at the margins of traditional uh, institutions. And so for us it's, it's key to understand how they are defying these, uh, these historical problems, uh, because they, they are doing that with their own resources, uh, with low-cost tools, with, but with high impact. That's why <laughs> our project is called Mucho con Poco. Uh, so I think that we need to f not, not focus, but also see what practices are being done there, how they connect, uh, how are they precisely defining these issues. Um, and coming back to the <laughs> social movements, um, mm. we have also witnessed uh, that their logics are also 
um, quite different from social movements from the um, 19th century uh, cases. Uh, they are being, you know, having this logic of, of networks of um, they are they ha don't have an organizational leadership, uh, but this happens that they, you know, uh, pop up. They are these the new movements that you're referring to, like yes. movements that are occurring in, in Latin America in the re in recent years. Right. Yes. Like Jose Centenarios, Jesus Unidos, Ni Una Menos, um, and they um, they. They have been triggered because of one demand, but uh, this demand also acts as a catalyst of uh, other demands ha that have been piling up over the years, and that reflects this uh, this content that we are talking about, this this content on democracy. Uh, but we also have found uh, when we um, go out, of well, we you know. Uh, Yes, go out of the traditional methodologies of political sciences, and we when we go to the territory, that uh, these uh, social movements don't dilute; they they have they leave traces. Uh, this is the case of Yo Soy 132 in Mexico. Uh, recently, okay, yesterday we have been talking about this. Um, it's a movement that one may have said that uh, it didn't have an impact. Uh, but what we have seen, and working with these actors uh, since uh, 2012, uh, the people who have been directly involved, many young people who have been directly involved with the social movement, or who have become actively involved in politics because of the social movement, or because they supported the movement, uh, then were the ones that, uh, this generation were, was the one which um, Created or founded uh, social uh, civil society institutions, organizations like alternative um, alternative media uh, or artivism organizations. Um, many of them also are part of Wikipolitica, uh, an organization which wants to change political structures from the inside. Uh, they, after the earthquake this year in Mexico, they this generation was also. Uh, one of uh, of which uh, supported verified 19s and now are organi organizing themselves as uh, organized civil society through Ciudadanía 19s. Uh, so I think that they they are living traces and they are um, having political incidents. They go from protests to proposals, uh, and that's uh, the, the the context we are operating in and the context where we think we, we need to have an eye on uh, for uh, qualitative, qualitative changes in our democracies or maybe the survival of democracies in our region. Okay. Valeria, you've also been working with some of these groups. Can you, for the sake of the audience, can you describe a little bit more what this group of emerging actors are? Who are, who are we talking about? Yeah, we're seeing this, uh, what we've called civic infrastructures it, at Avina, and we call them like th that because they're a group, as, as um, Antonella has said, they're not the traditional social movements, but they have been organizing through uh, structure, uh, membership, uh, through uh, decision making. They have rules on decision making processes, and they also, their identity has not, is not it uh, identified as one different, one specific identity or sorry, ra racial gender, but they, they in themselves identify as citizens. And they have proclaimed their citizen idea, uh, identity as something that for them is a thing that they're going to mobilize for, um, to reclaiming rights and to reclaiming how to enter into politics and occupy those spaces of decision making. And I think I, one thing that I wanted to point out about when we went through a study and asking also these this movements, what was their interest and why they were interested in, in entering politics. And one thing that we've, we've observed is that there were different strengths uh, among them. It's, and one, of course, there was the capacity of diff having different type of civic engagement, using technology to sort of um, diminish the gap and the asymmetry of participation. Uh, they were using really uh, hopeful narratives, thinking about politics with joy, 
politics with a heart, politics, politics with empathy. They were trying to move out of the discourse vis-a-vis -vis that the government is not working and we everything has to be changed, but they were l attacking into much more into the to the notion of the feeling and being empathetic with each other. Uh, they are not scared to fail. Uh, they're testing, they're experimenting, they're going out there, and they're not afraid that that might, maybe that initiative, that uh, sort of using that a certain tool will not work. So it's they're trying to sort of, they're, they're in a space, and I think a lot of the teenagers part that you were saying is like mm. when, Okay, I don't know the limits. So, but let's go. <laughs> so, the, um, so their 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 openness of of not failing it's it's really uh, significant. Uh, they are open also to work with different constituencies. They're not so much like oh, like I'm not going to work with this. I'm not going. To. They're open because they're coming also from a lot of of uh, them are coming from the open source movement and the open data movements. So where Creative Commons is their is their sort of brand. So for them, sharing information, sharing strategies, sharing this that all type of things is a something that is a value itself, and that's something that they they really um, think that's important. That they think that also horizontal decision making, collective decision making, is important. They don't want to be represented by one figure or other. Um, so I would I would end up I think that. We have a video, and I think that uh, with this video and what they portray in this video, and we all, all our organization participated th th in this event, s show you what is the type of, of, of discourse this uh, uh, structures, at least in Wikipolitica in Mexico, that's, as Antonella says, is a, is a movement that came from Yo 132, <coughs> and after after they decided to run for office, uh, a young a man, Pedro Kumamoto, 25, 25 years, uh, in 2015 decided to run for lo uh, to be local deputy, and uh, with the idea with the, the state of, Jalisco, the state of in Mexico. Jalisco in Mexico, and with the idea that they want to occupy politics and they want to uh, tour out the walls and really wanted to s make sure that there's uh, active participation. In, in decision making. So we can maybe show right, a so little. Let's, let's spend a couple of minutes just watching this video that Avina prepared. Did Avina prepare it or who prepared it? Yeah, yeah, we, the clip, we are the from oh, the clip. In the, okay. The sound, I don't know. Entonces, ante todo esto, ¿por qué hicimos un festival? Creo que muchas personas no lo preguntaron. Y es sencillo, hicimos un festival porque ya marchamos, porque ya salimos a las calles, ya alzamos la voz y nuestros representantes siguen ajenos sin escucharnos. Hicimos un festival para festejar que en 2015 nos decidimos y estuvimos convencidas que se podía hacer una política y campañas austeras creativas e innovadoras y desde ese momento lo hemos comprobado. Quisimos encontrarnos porque sabemos lo decepcionados que estamos y las ganas que tenemos también por hacer que esto cambie. Es por eso que esta es una invitación a todas esas personas que se sienten ajenas, aquellas que militan o no en partidos políticos, aquellos que se acercaron al PRI, al PAN, a PRD, a Morena, a Nueva Alianza, etc. Siempre con la esperanza de cambiar la realidad. Desafortunadamente aquellas personas que ahí estuvieron, pero que se encontraron con la corrupción, con el clientelismo, con el tráfico de influencias, a todas esas personas, este mensaje es claro. Les decimos que esta es su casa. Creemos que existen personas valiosas en todos los espacios. Creemos que existen servidores públicos que están al pendiente de lo que pueden mejorar. 
hay estudiantes dispuestos también a involucrarse en la política, aquellos a los que han obligado a asistir a eventos condicionando su apoyo, a los que obligaron a ir la semana pasada a votar, a todas esas personas que hoy están aquí, a los que faltan pero nos están viendo a través de un medio digital, les queremos decir que esto es también en su casa, que aquí es donde se puede soñar y sobre todo que aquí es donde podemos construir. Muchas gracias. En este momento no puedo ocultar la emoción que siento de buscar representar la agenda de este movimiento, de estas personas en el Senado de la República. Quiero decirles que no estoy solo y que este esfuerzo hoy recibe a nuevas y a nuevos integrantes. Quiero presentárselos. Mi nombre es Susana de la Rosa Hernández. Mi nombre es Rodrigo Cornejo. Mi nombre es Pepe Martínez. Mi nombre es Roberto Castillo. Soy Paola Flores. Soy Alberto Vale. Mi nombre es Susana Ochoa. Mi nombre es Adrián Gorosica y buscaré representar la agenda de Wikipolítica en el Congreso Local de Yucatán. En el Congreso Federal. En el Congreso Local de Jalisco. En el Congreso Local de la Ciudad de México. En el Congreso Local. En el Congreso Local. En el Congreso Federal. Voy a buscar representar la agenda que hemos construido en estos cuatro días en el Congreso Local. Gracias. Very inspiring. <laughs> yeah. So what I like about this video is that it really portrays some of that sense of um, civil society activism that goes through the streets, that signs petitions, that does all of those things that advocacy normally entails. Mm -hmm. And at that point, this, and at some point decide, okay, it's time to be also part of politics. And, That's something that here at, at, at the National Endowment for Democracy, we're, we're following very closely. And so it, it would be great if you guys can tell us more about this. Um, do you see this experience replicating in other places? Is this something that is just happening in Mexico? Does it feed from experiences from other places? What's, what's your, you, probably you saw some of them in the video themselves. So maybe you guys can tell us a little bit more. Uh, I'll start, but definitely uh, uh, Antonella and Pablo have a, a lot to say. Definitely, this, this is not an, uh, something that's only happening in Mexico. We've seen this happening in Brazil, in Belo Horizonte, there's a movement called Muitia Ciudades, uh, led by uh, Aure Carolina Freitas, a uh, young black activist that decided to run also to, to Pesol with this idea, actually, Just in, in December, they're going to do inspired. They, she was here, so inspired of, of, of Wikipolitica, also having that going to the streets and, and engaging with people in a different way. We've seen also in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, Bancada Activista, a group of young um, activists that decided also to run for office and they elected one council women that they went into coalition. We've seen that in Colombia, we've seen that in Guatemala. Uh, so it's this is this something that is not only happening in Latin America, and they're also being inspired by the Europeans. What's happening in Barcelona uh, from the, the movement of Barcelona en Común uh, and Podemos. There have been uh, sort of, when we think about where all those social movements went, a lot of them went to organize organizations, but also they want to really thinking of occupying politics in a different way. And what, at least at the Conexiones Latinoamericanas de Innovación Política, uh, a project we partner with NED, is that we want that cro cross pollinization of experiences. We want that this experience know each other, that they want to reflect among peers and really uh, get inspired each other, <laughs> that, that reviving and revitalizing democracy is a good for everyone. And, and I think that that's something that uh, young people are inspiring us a different generation. Pablo, do you see this as an anti-systemic <sighs> motion, uh, movement? 
that, that was we worry about that? that that was exactly what i was thinking about that i think that uh, we're living like at the moment uh parallel processes in in latin american politics and that sometimes at the moment at least in very few times they touch ping no and they and and what 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 are these two parallel uh versions or or processes on the one hand for example i see all these the big fights of institutionality no and th let's think about uh corruption no like the, the in the past few years we've seen like the huge uh phenomenon of of corruption in latin america that tr uh, transnational version of 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 odebrecht no the, the brazilian company that uh bribed governments all around latin america uh in order to get uh public contracts thousands and thousands of millions of dollars were paid here and there and nowadays we're starting to live in in some some places with more strength in others with less this fight against the the big corruption scandals the big corruption of institutions and that's like wh what's happening on the one side no and and that's one part of the of the political fights that many many people are are having and and stating and I won't go into details of the political changes, the the recent pol or or the flow of political changes from a very uh, left-winged Latin America and progressive uh, 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 governments in Latin America now starting to move a little bit more to the right. In the case of Argentina, most probably in in the recent future in in Chile, also in Peru, etc. But w that's another form. The, Let's think about this fight against corruption, against institutions, which have led at least three particular examples. The case in Brazil with President Dilma, the case in Peru that, that has the three past presidents connected to corruption scandals, and in, in other terms, but also the case in Guatemala. No? So what happened there? The, the fracture of these democratic institutions fractured and then like trying to say, well what happens now who goes in who's going to step in and 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 participate eagerly into these institutions in the case of guatemala uh, this comedian turned into a politician stepped in and just less than a year after g getting in office he's now uh, followed by very hard corruption scandals or irregularities in the financial of his campaign etc so that's one part and on the other part they've already spoken about it that the margins of political institutions. No, what's happening there? Young people participating, or at least groups of young people participating. In these cases, I think it's a very, very uh, uh, concentrated part of young people no? uh, with certain characteristics, with certain access to education, to certain resor resources, and trying to build a movement. No? Valeria has uh, uh, flawlessly talked about these characteristics of organization, of collaborative decision-making, of uh, defining an agenda collectively as well, etc. No? And I think that that's happening very anti-systemically no? with this idea of we're going to break down the walls and we're going to break what's happening and we're going to step in and just... And I think that that's one of the, the issues that I think it's very interesting on how these different spaces will eventually connect. How the traditional politics in Latin America will have necessarily to feed with the, uh, the, the new voices, the new uh, programs, the new uh, structures of these other movements. Because it's necessary. Right now we're, we're, we're leaving a moment in, 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 in which uh, uh, public parties are in great um, crisis as well as the legi legitimacy in Congress. So we need new structures. Now, wh how we're going to bridge these needs of uh, renovating the, 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 the versions of democracy in Latin America and having these movements that have been felt in many cases as, as anti-systemic to interact with the... the uh, institutions. No? What do you think about that, Valeria? <laughs> <laughs> I think, I don't know, I'm not so sure that they're, so 
anti-systemic. They, they do believe in institutions, in democratic institutions. They believe in political parties. The thing is that they're not, the political parties are not delivering what they were intended to deliver. Uh, they're questioning patronage, they're questioning decision-making process, they're, s they're questioning the way they enter into politics and how politics are done, uh, not necessarily the institutions per se. I, I don't know if, I've, if I, I explain myself. I think that what they see as their the, the offer, uh, as a stagnated, that is not really resonating what the public is demanding. And what they want to challenge is that they, one, people can be, uh, can be in politics and political and, participa and participate if you diminish the barriers of participation. It's that saying that there is, of course, people do not participate because there's sometimes you demand something to your local official when that has to do with federal things. So it's like I'm demanding, and of course there's that there's a disconnection and there's no delivery. In our countries, first people do not participate because they don't have time. They have to like make a living. So it's like there's also another barrier. Um, and then there is there is also a complexity for entering in those institutions. As you said, you have to be educated. You have to have sort of how the politic arena has been like you have to have connections is a really clientelist so that's what they're defined defining uh defying is that they want to enter into politics with breaking sort of that gaps trying to make the the power asymmetry less in order to show that with low cost campaigns <laughs> that t going back and knocking to the doors to, to bring your leaflet and really talk about your agenda can pay um, success. And people are willing to mobilize and they're willing to open that door of, of uh, other agendas because they want to be engaged. So I think that that's m more than, maybe I'm understanding differently anti-systemic, mm -hmm. but I think that there are what they are challenging is that they don't want to be in the status quo. They don't. They don't want to to see that the elite uh, decide politics. That the only some ones that have uh, certain advantage of information, about advantage of resources, can decide about the public goods. That's something that they're challenging. But I think that not necessarily. <laughs> but so one. I think one thing that's important here is. You guys are talking about you know, different <coughs> forms of political innovation, new actors, um, the transition from civil society to politics in many cases. Uh, but I'd like to hear about a couple of things. One, what are the issues in the agenda for these actors? What are they, what are they going on about? What is, what is it that they want in, in, in politics? And second, what are the tools that, are they that, that they're using. I mean, you, you guys in your organizations, in particular Ciudadano Inteligente, Asuntos del Sur, you, you discuss and reflect a lot on the use of technology and digital tools. So for those of us who perhaps studied political science in, in the 20th century, this is a little bit confusing. So if you guys can <laughs> tell us a little bit more about like what's that, what's, what's being used, that would be very useful. Okay, so uh, <coughs> our organization was, was born as a very civic tech organization. No? And, and with the understanding that uh, with technology, we could renovate the way that people interacted with politics. And I think that's in many ways something that has uh, inspired us to continue working. And, but, but something changed. No? Uh, initially, we worked a lot on developing technology, better technology, more complex technology that would allow us to participate better. And uh, right now, we're starting to shift a little bit and just w leaving technology as a second step, no? putting uh, in front the capacity to organize, to define a strategy, and then technology coming just, uh, just behind. In terms of what type of technologies that we've used, uh, 
we've gone all the way to processing big data no, of political parties and doing very complex analysis, no, and artificial intelligence, etc., to using WhatsApp no, or uh, Twitter to, to do some kind of complex uh, dynamics of participation. So in those terms, I would say that th we spoke a, a little bit about it yesterday, uh, and there are a lot of studies about it, there's no uh, silver bullet for in, in terms of, of tools, of technological tools, to uh, improve participation uh, everywhere and in all, uh, in all situations. We need to just adapt technology to the different uh, populations uh, from one situation to the other and be very flexible. And that's what's amazing for me of technology, that it allows you to adapt very quickly and adapt amazingly from one structure and one, one type of, uh, of uh, public to another one. And you don't have this huge program, this communication program that needs to uh, address everyone, but use this technology, community radios with this population, but use Twitter with this sector of the population that uses, or Facebook, or this particular media outlet or technological, or this certain app that also works uh, for, for somebody to interact with their election uh, uh, system. We have been using that. We, we've, uh, I have a lot of engineers in my team, so they're the, the first ones to say, no, we have this amazing technology. And then we have the, the communicators or the journalists that, that say, no, 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 we're, we need to solve uh, the other way. So we said, like, stop, let's go out to the streets, let's talk with the people, and we use a lot of human-centered design, no, which is design center in the traditions and the ways that people interact. And then we uh, define what technology will, will, will uh, be useful for, for that situation. It has worked well to open spaces that were not open before and to gather people that were not participating because the participation, uh, uh, access to participation was too difficult to make it very simple. And that's basically what we try to do in very different contexts. Uh, in, in very particular examples, for example, right now we're a few weeks away of the Chilean presidential election, and basically we try to promote that people uh, generate proposals for the candidates to adopt in their uh, presidential campaigns, you know, in their presidential programs. You know. Right now, it doesn't matter what president is elected, all of them have committed with citizen proposals. And we made a very simple uh, tool for people to present a proposal, and we're being the bridge. We take the, the, the citizens or the organizational proposals, we send them to the candidates, and we say like, okay, all the candidates, this is the proposal. Is any of you willing to adopt it and incorporate it into your program? Nowadays, all of them had ad have adopted them, and so we try to do that uh, very easily. And it's, a small, uh, it's an easy platform. It can be used everywhere. No? So that's basically one of the ideas. People are not interacted, I interacting with the election uh, campaigns because they, they're sick of only listening. What happens if we turn the microphone around and we tell the people, what's your proposal? And see if they are willing to accept it. Okay. our journey was like kind of reverse uh, to to theirs. Uh, we've started working, as I've said, with uh, people who were at, um, who maybe had uh, scarce resources and uh, maybe they didn't use technology that much or maybe they use technology but low-cost technology. Um, and we have started with um, observing uh, and exchanging experiences on how to organize groups, uh, community groups, uh, and actors through analogical tools uh, or methodologies. Uh, how does an organization uh, which has no clear leadership uh, make decisions? Um, examples such as sociocracy, it's, it's a concept that I, w I wouldn't like to address uh, because it, I'm not uh, so familiar with that, but it's a concept um, which uh, shows that there are ways to to organize and to make decisions in at a, an organization or a group of people uh, with this logic of horizontality. 
Uh, we have then um, started working with this intersection between political participation and technology uh, because we have seen experiences uh, such as Ciudadan Inteligente where there they were um, putting these, these uh, civic tools uh, you know, for political participation and for decision-making processes. Um, and one of the things that I would like to say is uh, also uh, this idea that, that, that Pablo was, was saying in order to, to broaden the scope of political participation, we don't have to stick to technology. We have to find other ways or to fi find the different tools, the different technological tools for each community. Um, and there are many, many limits to, to this opportunity that the Internet gives us. I mean, it's a great tool uh, to broaden political participation, but uh, we have to be super careful uh, because there are also certain threats to uh, to deepen the, the or strengthen democracies. Uh, the first one is precisely uh, the gap in terms of access. Uh, it is usually uh, like you know, white people, urban uh, people. Uh, people who have had an access uh, early to internet, who have acquired uh, maybe, uh, you know, digital literacy in, in a great way. I don't, I don't say that, uh, others don't, but uh, there's also like uh, an elite uh, when in terms of users of the internet. And sometimes uh, this digital gap can uh, deepen the already existing uh, inequalities in our society. So when, when we are uh, enabling tools for online particip uh, political participation, we have to take into account this. And we have to, and we, I say we, uh, not only civil society, but also government, enterprises, I mean, we all. <laughs> uh, we need to address um, infrastru infrastructure, affordability, enabling users, usability, uh, that content is uh, available in the languages of the people in our countries. Uh, that there are um, public spaces for people to uh, have access to the internet, such as libraries. Uh, because otherwise, uh, and <laughs> this is something that we always like to say, at otherwise, uh, we are digitalizing the status quo. Uh, and another thing that, that comes from, from this topic is uh, the, the threat not to put internet governance into the political agenda. Um, there are, um, you know, we have to have an eye on internet regulations. We need to have an eye on um, growing actors that are criminalizing association or expression, political expressions online, uh, on states that are buying spyware or that are opting for internet shutdowns. Um, Access Now and uh, an organization that works on digital rights uh, have, have been documenting internet shutdowns in the world. On 2015, they've documented 15 uh, cases. Last year, uh, they've documented uh, 50 f 56 cases. And among those cases, there were, there were two Latin American countries. Uh, and those internet shutdowns especially come when it's election time. So we have to have an eye on, this, on these issues because if we are talking about online political participation, and although already we have 40% of people in Latin America who have no access to the internet, uh, those who are connected, uh, we have to guarantee that they can express their thoughts, their, what they want to say, uh, within a context and an environment of privacy, security, and security not only online but also offline, like physical security, uh, because that uh, th those rights are a threat for journalists, for activists, for people. Uh, so that's why I think that also to innovate is to put certain topics into the political agenda, and I think that internet governance should be in that political political agenda. And that's why also uh, we have a, a, an area within uh, Asuntos del Sur, which is Innova Politica, where we also work on issues regarding uh, uh, internet governance. That's why we say that we can use technology to, to democratize politics, but we also need politics to democratize technology. Okay. And, and um. I will tap in just a <coughs> like 
the latter is the sense that of the issues you were saying. Mm -hmm. Yes, this they are also demanding um, in their in their platforms in the programmatic platforms. Uh, you were asking like about uh, the access to an exercise of rights. Uh, they're thinking about human rights violations. They're thinking about governance and how internet governance uh, it's important. They're thinking about climate change. They're thinking about the nature. So they are putting. So it's not only about the form. How do you do politics? So do the mechanisms, but also the substance of why what they want to put at the agenda as a narrative of of uh, inclusion, of of really thinking about diversity and other type of of issues. They're putting open that into government. open government. So so they are discussing topics and issues, and it's not only about the forms and the digital tools but it's also th about the substance. Okay. I would like to add something to, to that. Um, one of the interesting things also uh, that, uh, that we have been witness witnessing in Latin America is that, uh, for instance, the case in Guatemala, uh, when people went to the streets to protest because of uh, a specific case of corruption in Guatemala, uh, it also had an impact on other countries in the region uh, who also in the case of Honduras, they then also went to the streets to demand al also uh, to to mm, to fight against corruption. Uh, and for instance, when it was uh, Vemprarua in Brazil, uh, they uh, activists who, who went to the streets there had a video conference with activists in uh, in Turkey because although the the social movements are triggered, for instance because of a specific, a certain demand, it, solves, it also has to uh, has a relation with a, a more broader demand, such as corruption, such as exclusion, uh, etc., uh, diversity, etc. Uh, so that, that's also something interesting because it, um, it allows other uh, people, other activists, uh, young people, <laughs> old people, whatever, uh, to, to feel that that demand is also theirs, even though it's from another country, from another region or community. Uh, and that's also uh, one of the interesting themes because we, we can discuss this uh, being from or coming from different backgrounds and we can have this logic of network of collaboration within countries, within regions, but uh, with certain demands as the demands that we want to defend. Okay. I think yeah. Let's let's now open to the to the public. Um, if you guys have any questions, please identify yourselves so that we we know who you are. Um, and there should be some mics going around. So we start here with the gentleman. Well, um, I was only a student when Fidel Castro and Che Guevara were traveling through the countries of Latin America, selling the stupid idea that we are poor in Latin America, politically underdeveloped, scientifically underdeveloped, because the, U the US has been responsible. The only thing that Castro never explained is that we started our colonial process over a hundred years before, and we cannot blame the North for the problem that we have inherited from Spain in the 15th century when Spain moved to Latin America. I congratulate you for the efforts you are doing, but you know where your efforts are going to be more important in Cuba. Cuba has depends on Russia when Russia fell without shooting one single shot, the uniforms that the students in Cuba had disappeared. Now they were maintained by Venezuela, and Venezuela is now worse than Cuba. So very soon, all your initiatives, your ideas, are going to be more important in Cuba than anywhere else. Castro was successful, but not only in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Nicaragua, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, and in many ways, 
all over Latin America. My suggestion is keep working because your ideas sooner or later will be necessary in this country, in the U.S. too. <laughs> Thank we you are much. now forgetting that democracy is only one thing, is the participation of the citizens. The delegates of the citizens, in this case, Congress, paralyzed here, giving open room for executive orders and what used to be called uh, democratic cesarism, which is one ruler may be elected. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take a couple more questions so that we can get around a, here in the middle. Uh, hi, good afternoon. My name is Naid Svodbik. I'm a new grants officer here at the NED, and I'm going to be actually taking care of all three of you as my grantees. Ooh. So I thought um, I would ask you just one question. I'm curious to know about, um, in terms of political innovation, how each of you really measure success. Um, I know that we saw in the video that you have inserted certain political activists in campaign, both local and at the federal level. But as far as usage of technology or as far as anything else that you're working on in your specific programs, how do you measure success? Uh, do you have any specific metrics that you could share with us? Um, we'd love to know that. OK. Um, somebody, somebody else in the back I saw first, and then we go. We go OK. No, the back. No. And then we go to you guys. Um, Thanks, uh, Joaquin Vallejo from PADF. My question is, <clears throat> how do we um, learn from, from past experiences? I know that there's a lot of differences between, <clears throat> for example, the strategy that Wikipolitica is using from <clears throat> other things seen in the region in the past, but the discourse itself reminds me a lot of outsider politics uh, a decade ago, for example, in Ecuador, where I'm from, in Alianza País, the uh, party of Rafael Correa, this was their discourse. Of course, they were organized around that caudillo. I think the horizontal um, decision making is quite innovative in, in this case. And there's different tools and different um, spaces but uh, being exploited. But how do you ensure that they really embrace liberal democratic values and how to avoid the risk of this um, being co-opted by interest groups and eventually devolving in populism, basically. All right. I think those, we have excellent questions to, to begin the, the discussion of, with the public. So why don't you guys start off? Who wants to take? Um, I will go with the uh, past experiences and learning from them before. Uh, I think you, it's, it's very correct what you're saying and I think that we spend very little time in evaluating our processes no? in terms of, of what we learned etc no? uh, what were our successes our failures systematize that information and communicate it no? and I think that's that's one of the, of the great challenges of civil society not only in Latin America but everywhere to really, really have the amount of resources to systematize like very professionally and in depth our uh, learnings and then make these learnings accessible. And I think it's, it's been very hard uh, to do so. But I think that's, that's one of the, of the things that we should do. In our case in particular, uh, coming or, or having a lot of people coming from the tech sector we work a lot with agile methodologies, which are like very, very short-term processes that are very, very high, highly evaluated. I mean, very in-depth e evaluations. And like, it's a fail-fast context. And in politics, sometimes we used to say, no, let's have longer processes and periods. So, but we try to do like very short-term, no? in, the, in the ways that we uh, make prototypes, we then, design, test, no, let's do it once again. And I think that in politics in general, we're not as good uh, as to prototype and test before doing a huge public policy of millions. No? And that goes for the uh, public sector, but also in particular with small organizations that go out with a hypothesis and they may spend 
ser several years testing the, the, those hypotheses and not trying to generate like smaller term uh, cycles to evaluate and to systematize and uh, communicate those systematizations. That's something that we're trying to do a lot, systematize our, our own experiences and try to, to share them. Open source, and open source helps a lot with that. No? You open all your, your, uh, your insight no? for others to see. In terms of m measuring success, <sighs> all of our, like, go, originally, all of our measures, or all of our indicators, were the amount of clicks. No? And we obviously found out that that was saying nothing. No? We may, may, ha may have had uh, thousands upon thousands of, of clicks to one platform and have zero impact in an election. So we're trying to uh, have a more uh, diverse uh, set of, of indicators that have to do with interaction with other organizations, uh, in terms of outreach, obviously we try to keep on having all the, the, the amount of clicks, no? in terms of the, the, the amount of people that we reach out, but also having the interaction of media. No? Sometimes we have some, some programs or plans that have to do with specific laws, so how uh, successful we are on advocating for certain laws, uh, uh, etc. So we have like very the diverse, I can sh uh, share some more specific uh, of, the, of our indicators. Uh, I'll, I'll first tackle that measure and success, and then that's linked with uh, the avoiding of the risk of being co-opted and what we've not seen. So the first of like measure and success, um, yeah, definitely a challenge. Like, what do we mean by success? Do we mean that there are moving and shifting power, a visible power, making new laws, ha engaging with different constituencies, uh, or we are talking about that invisible power that we call changing narratives. Uh, so we, we have that two sets of indicators and we were looking into what first, how, they're how they, sh they are gaining and increasing um, some skills and capacities in order to that make that shift for proposing new laws, have a technical assistance that the laws that they're proposing could be successful, having engaging different constituencies, how much, how many diverse people they meet, but also what is sort of how much they are pr being portrayed from being a local uh, based movement to expanding to, for example, in the case of Wikipolitica, to expand to nine states, to being Pedro Kumamoto, one of the most uh, in, in the expansion last uh, uh, magazine was one of the 50 most uh, transformative m Mexicans. Uh, changing, really transforming Mexican. So that's how we are trying to measure sort of success. Of course, how also we have to qu ask them, how do they measure success themselves? Uh, because it's not only about how we portray them and how do we see them, how do they want to see themselves and how much they want to see if for them success is having a bigger constituency, having a structure. For them, asking them, that they do not have, they have an um, army of volunteers, but how much they are willing to have a, uh, actually a post and financial access and resources to make uh, transit to a, a loose organization to a much more structured organization. So that's the type of things that then takes me to your question about co-option and support. It's like, of course, we haven't, this is not, this movement, we've seen them before. I think that it's, this is not new that new movements and young people are entering into politics and they wanted to gain that spaces. The thing that we've seen that's different is that they're really questioning that practices. They're not, they don't want to be a see the horizontal, uh, the thing that you, you say that is innovative is the horizontal and the openness. And I think it's not a minor thing because they are really challenging how you engage in politics. They don't want to have the the closed door uh, negotiations. They want to, t they, they're, they're pushing for open parliament. They're pushing for being at the spotlight, see, telling people, like uh, the practice of telling people who they come to visit. Like if there's a constituent, they put them in the, in, in the door. This month, all these um, interest groups came and see me. This month, th I did this uh, event and somebody supported and this uh, transparently openly they
they tell you who they're getting engaged. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that um, us groups, we're trying to provide them support, different support from seeing different experiences, engaging with, the, uh, gaining different um, knowledge, and really it is, it's, it's a matter of time. Uh, we cannot say if this go they're going to be at the end successful or at how do we portray that. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's something we treasure in the sense that they are at least not willing to uh, go into the path of the status quo. And, and that's something really good to follow. And I guess in some of these cases that you've been discussing today, part of this agenda, addressing the part of, democrat of liberal democracy, uh, precisely the ideas of open government, of transparency, that are so high up in the agenda of these groups are essentially items of the contemporary liberal democratic agenda. So, you know, I guess in that sense, that's also slightly different um, access to rights and so on. So, let's do another round of, of questions. I saw a few hands also over here. In the front. Here, in the, I think she's, she's here. Thanks. Is on? Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, Gantuya from Mongolia, so I might uh, speak uh, a little bit odd because we are talking about Latin America here. And uh, we, uh, as Mongolia is sandwiched between Russia and China, we are there really trying hard to uh, strengthen and uh, strengthen our democracy to uh, make it more healthier. Um, but uh, all the difficulties you mentioned is still there with the very deep rooted. And, uh, and looking at, the, uh, at this inspirational video, I kind of thought <laughs> what, uh, with what you said like about this uh, uh, teenage, uh, teenager level of democracy. And uh, that kind of made me think like, oh, are we, in, you know, are we the bad ch child of uh, this family? <laughs> or, you know, because, <laughs> you know, in, in one family, you have several children, and one uh, would be very good and uh, outstanding in school, and other would be getting into trouble, and no matter uh, what the parents do. <laughs> so it's like I was thinking, are we that kind of children? Because we are, like, really having this bad, um, you know, difficult challenges. Uh, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons I'm here in the States. And... Um, I wanted to know about, uh, you know, I'm here to seek more uh, possibilities, engagements, network, and, uh, you know, support uh, for better democracy in my country. So the two questions, one was this uh, uh, Wiki Politica. Is this in English or is it, will it be in <laughs> the language that I, <laughs> I don't understand? Or, and also, uh, how the, 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 the youngsters, the, this new emerging, uh, passionate uh, activists, uh, you know, came out and demonstrated themselves and uh, have this uh, organized uh, and uh, you know organized way of going uh, in the in this um, politics. So uh, these two questions. Okay, Thanks. good. I saw some hands in the back. In the back, gen the gentleman. I'm Michael Brentnell. I'm formerly director of the American Political Science Association but a founding member of a small network, Inter-American Network for Public Administration Education that works with some of the PA schools in the region. It's, it's headquartered now with uh, Christian Pluskov in Chile. And I'm interested in your perspective on what the universities are doing in Latin America, uh, both in public policy areas in general, but in particular to start to develop um, degree programs to support a new generation of civil society leaders. If you'll forgive me, for three of the four of you, there's data in the bios, and you all earned your advanced degrees outside of Latin America. I don't know, and I, I have a feeling this is not so much a coincidence, but an indication that that programming doesn't really exist within Latin America at the levels we might hope for. And I'm curious as to what we can be doing to help to build that capacity within Latin American institutions. Anybody else for now? I think Over here. Hi, my name is Fabiola Cordova. I'm an associate director here at, at NET. I actually had a question that um, I think kind of went along the lines of the outsider politics. Um, 
what would you say, I mean, I think in some countries where you have established and you may even say entrenched party systems, like in Mexico, where you have three very stable political parties, um, and you have a lot of young, innovative candidates coming in as with new movements, um, how much are they re renovating the political leadership of existing political parties, and how much are they changing kind of at the end of the day in like the in policies, in legislation, the status quo? Or are they kind of taking away votes, if you want quotation marks, um, from other progressive candidates that would have otherwise made it? I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. kind of fully ma making my, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my question known. And then the other question I had is I think that a lot of the movements that you have are describing started at issue-based movements, like Yes Unidos, Ni Una Mas, but how can they really broaden their agenda so that they have broader appeal beyond mm -hmm. the one or two issues that, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, they're known for? So. Mm -hmm. All of them excellent questions. Sí. So why don't we start from, from there to here, since yeah. I always start with Valeria. Yeah. Ah, OK. First of all, thank you for coming, really. <laughs> uh, it would be like it, it demonstrates your, your genuine interest for learning from uh, other, other regions. And I think it's crucial uh, in terms of, of the uh, coming out of, of these political young actors. I think most of them come from issue-based or, or issues that were happening. No? For example, uh, students in, in Mexico no? or in Chile, no? a student movement that uh, appeared due to a particular reform and then um, started to mobilize through sometimes very sporadic movements, like for example, Yo Soy 132 in Mexico, with the, the happening of, of a political campaign that like kind of threw the, the young people that, no, 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 they're not protesting, they're paid for. And so young people say, what? No, 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 we're independent and we're here protesting because that's what we feel like. And that small trigger detonated a huge movement. No? And that was a specific case no, in the case of Chile, it was a reform in the uh, education agenda, and that made that the, the education uh, unions moved, the, the, the student unions moved, and that uh, generated uh, s several leaderships. So I think it's mostly uh, detonated through specific agendas or spe specific issues that mobilized, and then some leaders appeared, no, which then is is one of the great challenges turning those leaderships or individual leaderships into uh, some more more uh, horizontal communities, no? And that's what may generate other other types of of uh, of politics. Because th that turning to that your question, we have a lot of cases of young politicians with old politics politics, no? And that's like th the most frustrating, no? <laughs> Having like fresh young faces, but with the most traditional and uh, like the status quo practices, like, and it's like, what? How? No? Where did you learn that? You're so young. Well, whatever, no? But it's it it happens so much. So there, are th there are different practices. Valeria talked about them uh, very clearly, like the, the open space, the open agenda, being hyper trans transparent and very uh, the the idea of the we no I'm surprised several of these these leaders no they understand th themselves as moderators of a movement mm -hmm. and not the leaders of the movement you know and that idea is like a conceptual <laughs> no when it's like I'm not the leader with a flag on top I'm just the moderator of what we all think and we are collectively building. And this uh, train of thought is, is, for me, what changes this concept of leadership and, and of, 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 of these movements. And I think that's also a very systemic, it has to do with education, it has to do with technology, definitely, and it has to do with the type of leadership that 
is, is not here anymore. We don't have these caudillos. Uh, 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 I mean, we do have them, but it's not the type of, of new leaderships that are trying to get a lot of traction. No? Uh, as for the education, I think that Antonella is the right person <laughs> to <laughs> answer. <Yes>. <laughs> what uh, Palo Senora, <laughs> not that left wing, but um, yes, that uh, there are, these layers maybe start with a specific demand, and then the thing is that uh, it's important to create uh, a, civic, a new civic culture, which is based in these, uh, these characteristics that they've, they've been talking about, horizontality, open source, but open source not only software, but also uh, our way of thinking about politics, our way of thinking about uh, how we, we organize uh, groups, or how we organize uh, our, our initiatives. Um, so yes, that's, uh, w we must think on how are we training uh, leaders, the new leaders for the next, uh, not only for, for the next generation, but also uh, who will be taking uh, power now or who aim to access power. Um, in that regard, uh, we are, the, the three organizations are, are doing a, a great job uh, trying to, to uh, bring tools and to bring experiences to emerging leaders uh, or people who are already in power, but they uh, want new ways or, or new forms to to solve different topics or different issues. Uh, precisely in the case of uh, Asuntos del Sur, we have uh, developed this year, we have launched an Academy of Political Innovation. In fact, we have done that because we have done a research on uh, capacity building programs for political leaders. And we found out that they those programs are concentrated geographically in specific cities from specific uh, countries in Latin America. Uh, they also lack uh, some topics that for us are uh, essential when we want to train leaders for the 21st century. Uh, they, they are too focused on uh, public um, managing public ad uh, administration. But uh, and as <laughs> we were talking yesterday, uh, some of them may uh, approach ICT or social media, but as a tool, f or another way of um, a new communication um, channel, but not as a tool for political participation or for uh, co-creation with citizens. So uh, that's why we said, okay, uh, we are not training leaders with the tools and experiences that we've been uh, witnessing along these years of work, along these things that we've been uh, seeing in, in Latin America, these experiences of horizontality, of collaboration, of deliberation, and more direct democracies. Uh, so that's why we build this online platform and we have a first program on political innovation, uh, which aims to uh, propose tools and to propose experiences and methodologies that are centered on the human being uh, in order to uh, train uh, future leaders and current leaders uh, with these tools. Uh, and also... Uh, the Political Innovation Academy. Academy, uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, but I would also like to <laughs> give space for, for Vale and, uh, and Pablo because they are also uh, in, in other projects trying to uh, provide this type of tools uh, to, to emerging leaders. Yeah, I will say about the universities and I'll tag, right? because uh, I think that definitely there are new fron frontier agendas and I think that the university have to develop much more quickly their curriculum to attend, to really have the, an the provide the sort of the issue, like issue based and, and the techniques and the tools that new generation is demanding. I think that definitely technology, um, from the use of technology to the, to the adaptation of technology, to the, how Antonella says, like open source, not only at a software base, but also thinking outside the box. And I think universities are sort of a great space to experiment and to test and to debug bunk uh, uh, traditional ideas or to renovate. So I think that, that there's, there's, um, there's a need of that. I, I don't know, I think that there, there's happening in, 
and I think I don't know if why we all three studied <laughs> abroad. <laughs> I studied abroad a long time ago. But um, I think that what we see is that these movements are emerging emerging from universities. Like Yo Soy 132, as Pablo said, was a, an, um, a university emergence. Like the, the movement in Chile was students in universities. So I think that there are spaces as a like not only about our teenage democracy, but in a, in a we are at that moment in life when we are in the university <laughs> that we want to defy uh, uh, different um, uh, theoretical dilemmas. And I think universities have to be renovating their curriculum in order to provide that space and that new tools. So I think that... Well, so in your experiences, have you found that in Latin America? Have you found that there is any intention of renovation in the university level? I mean. Of course, that students participate in politics and create these movements is almost like a, like their duty. I, I feel like no, you know, if you're a student, then you should be active in that sense. But are you finding tools in in the in the institutionalized setting of education in Latin America? I would say, <coughs> in in a very very small uh, sector. I, I mean, education in in Latin America is still a very unequal, it has a very unequal uh, yeah, Not everybody outreach. has access. Yeah. So, so on the one hand, you have uh, very, very, very few people that have access to very high education, either in their own countries or abroad. And then a lot of people that may be the first generation of, of uh, uh, university students. And, and we have... Uh, for example, in Mexico, the the local governments, the, if you are have a, a local degree, you're more than fit to be the 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 pr municipal president in 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 uh, <laughs> thousands of uh, municipalities in Mexico. No, and and that demonstrates the huge inequality on the access to education, where you have like a lot of places where it doesn't matter if you have any kind of degree you're fit and to very few sectors where you need a higher level uh, education uh, degree no so i think that there's not an incentive yet for education to really go into the next frontier or to the to the more uh, cutting edge aspects of public administration because right now it if you at least finish the first basic issue, fit. Huh? Yeah. I'd like to press a little bit more on the question of, of, the, of the bad child. I, I thought that was a really... Sí. So, are there conditions that are, you know, pertaining to Latin America and the Latin American countries that enable these movements to happen, that facilitate these emerging actors to, to flourish if we think that they're flourishing? Could this happen in other regions, or is this just you know a one-off thing? What are the conditions for that? What do they need in Mongolia to? Well, I, I had an, a, a hypothesis before, but it has been Debunked. recently <laughs> debunked. <laughs> debunked in many ways. No, which which I thought that s certainly, like Latin America, for example, with Eastern Europe, ha had a lot of things in common in terms of these new democratic institutions. So I, my hypothesis was that other places where more established democracies, it would be harder to just go in and move things around because they were more stable institutions, right? Uh, so I, I thought that in Latin America, it was very easy to just, as we're very teenager democracies, still trying to define our, our own sense and our own identity, it was easier to go in and move and change things. In, in certain terms, now I see that some very well-established democracies have also have that also no? uh, that that uh, possibility. And in those terms, like for me, I think th there's there's an issue in what I have seen in Latin America, at least, is that many institutions still have a very person-based capacity to change. So if there's this ministry and that the minister is someone that is really innovative and really willing to change things, 
he has a lot of space to work on. No? Obviously, a lot of uh, uh, legal barriers, but but it it is very person based. Uh, I think that the way that institutions work in in so many places in Latin America. So, for example, we have worked with what we call like open government champs no? or open government, yeah, like. Uh, superstars and they're the ones that help us move the agenda forward and I know that is that is happening not only in Latin America but but elsewhere no working with these particular actors that have the capacity institutional capacity to just have these these shifts I, I would say also like I think uh, there's two things yeah it's wiki politica is something you understood correctly and wiki came coming from how like Wikipedia that you create uh, knowledge together and people are able to to put you yeah, know in Wikipedia to open and and feel the portray like the information and it's a collaborative uh, collaborative platform so that's why they think they put their name Wikipolitica because to re to refrain that that's the way they wanted to do politics and so that's why they use the wiki part so uh, and and for me there's that tells I think that there is definitely places where the opens the open space for innovation is more broader and others that are more closed uh, and then that there's different conditions to that can allow that participation and um, flourish and and others in being inhibit but I think that as as long as there is uh, sort of certain condition when when I think of certain condition is like thinking about people willing to challenge that status quo and thinking about liberal democracy as a value and I think that that's something that we have to uh, uh, you know uh, treasure mm. uh, that when people are having opportunity to question to 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 um, to participate and when we think about participation I'm thinking about going to church and having a debate and participation is going to the to the football field and with the moms and talking about that they that part of, of, of participation we also have to uh, nourish those spaces uh, because in those spaces as, as we've seen is that they're also cost-based so if if something is not working in your neighborhood that you want to have a space where you can take your claims and and voice out what's not happening in your neighborhood. And I think that sometimes we uh, sort of romanticize that participation is everybody going to the streets and everybody uh, <laughs> uh, advocating for, er for a big issue. And I think participation, it has different forms and, and, ad ad and could be a play uh, uh, in different conditions uh, and with different support can be flourished. So I I, I believe like also like I'm a mom, so I don't I, I, I think that that not all <laughs> even if they're they're not the or not <laughs> um, a good boy are 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 need other type of support. If that doesn't need means that they're oh, let's <laughs> leave them <laughs> there because they might not have the conditions that we wanted. Maybe they need different conditions, maybe they need different support, maybe that we need to have different strategies to make sure that this all these kids <laughs> uh, grow up with a certain values and with a certain skills. Just maybe to, to add to what mm -hmm. Ole said, um, mm. I think that's uh, the reason why it's also so important to go back to the local, at the local level, uh, because as she, says, she said, uh, there are many atomized uh, experiences and practices of political innovation, be it at a church, be it a, at a um, at a municipality or, or whatever. Uh, I think that um, we we always like to go and think of the, the <laughs> to the the bigger game, but uh, we we always uh, need to. Uh, strengthen these practices that act at the local level uh, because it's where citizens have the the closest uh, you know uh, opportunity to to access and to participate in decision making processes and uh, yeah that's it <laughs> point. all right a final round of questions before we close over here hi uh, my name is this one 
Yes. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Jack Kropansky. I'm an independent writer. Um, a question about the, the second sector. You know, traditionally, uh, civil society is called the third sector. So you have government, business, and civil society. How are you viewing business? Because you talked a lot about politics, especially in Latin America. Is Do you see business as separate and possibly an ally, or they do you think of them as part of government and they're in cahoots? Or how far can you get if you focus on politics and in businesses on the side, or is is business is government just a, an arm of business? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. Well, at Fundación Abina, we were created thinking of of that we have to promote multi sector collaborations. That there was no one sector could uh, resolve all the challenges that we were experiencing in Latin America, and that we have to engage with government, with civil society, and with business. Because business have uh, the, the ability, when you change a business model, you change a lot of things and, uh, and affect a lot of lives, positively and negatively. So we wanted to sort of, our idea is, our, our vision of change is also like, if we all, the three sectors can collaborate to sh change that, that uh, for a, a common good, we can have much more sustainable and large scale changes. That said, mm -hmm. um, Definitely de depends, s s uh, here there's no whites, uh, blacks and whites, right? When you're talking about systems where there's crony capitalism and that you only have uh, business uh, also guarding the status quo for their own interest, well, there is really uh, a, sec a type of sector that definitely they are aligning with uh, political parties or political leaders in order to benefit their interests. But there are other sectors in, in business They are being affected by that type of policies. They want a com uh, competition. They want uh, sort of uh, really have been able to, to, to be in, a, in an equal uh, balance in order to, to do their, their, their jobs and their business and, and, and their, in their economies. So I think that the you could find allies that in the business sector, they're also questioning that type of status quo. They really want uh, also, they're not, they're, there's an eff like uh, also, um, they're affected by uh, organized crime, they're affected by violence, they're affected, so it's in their own interest to, to have strong democracies. They want certainty. Like in business, the most pressurable thing is that you have a certain rules where you, everybody's, all of my competitors uh, have the same rules and not, are not, um, have um, advantages. And I think that that's why we also, in, in politics and in this type of, of movements, we have to see the, pr the business sector not only uh, as, as an external side, because they are dictating politics. In some countries, they have been capturing the states and then deciding about rules and but I, I I'm saying that there this is not only s in some countries but and in and businesses there's not everyone as business is the same so we so we have to find those allies in the business sector that are willing to champion with us for also making sure that all these rules and those institutions function for all not for only the elite, or only that they are the privileged. Good. I want to take the privilege of being the moderator to ask a very final question and a final comment from each of you. So shall we be optimistic? I mean, we started by quoting some numbers about the feeling towards democracy in the region. We see these initiatives. Are we hopeful? A two-second response from each. Ah. <sighs> There you go. That was it. <laughs> uh, I would say yes, but uh, we still need to see more darker uh, practices before we'll start to see the light. That would be my, my answer. Okay. Uh, my hopes are getting in the way of the answer, so uh, I want to be optimistic. Um, Yes, I would say, say like a final comment is that uh, maybe it's it's this issue of uh, wanting or thinking about different a different type of democracy, where 
political parties, maybe uh, as they are at the core of uh, the current crisis, uh, maybe these practices are breaking loose from the monopoly of political parties, and maybe that's uh, one of the things that that we must see, and maybe that's where, if these pra these practices are, uh, in fact, uh, according to democratic values, maybe that's where the the hope lies. <laughs> Yeah, I'm optimistic. I'm I'm really optimistic seeing the, the possibility of, of of change. Definitely, there are still forces th and that want to maintain the status quo, and that's something that's real, and it's something that this our organization structures are facing every day. And we have to like we are like optimistic, and we they're they're facing we're fa facing an utopia, and that's why our work is so important to support this the success not only of this the the star uh, kids but the also for the organizations that are working locally small based with less resources that's also the need to sort of support those type of, of work so i think that yeah i'm i'm hopeful about uh, yeah good well, this has been a very interesting and engaging conversation. Uh, I thank you for coming to Washington all the way for a couple of days. Uh, thank you, everybody, for thank staying you. and for coming. Um, and we'll close. Thank you very much.